yard, over yard. Oh, we doing it like this today. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Basketball Heads Live. I am your host, Glenn Poo Harding. And tonight, we have a very, very special guest. This basketball head is a hip hop legend that helped shape the fabric of the culture alongside with his legendary partner, DJ Stretch Armstrong on WKCR. The duo introduced the world to unsigned acts like Nas, Biggie, Wu-Tang, as well as the unknown Jay-Z, Eminem, and the Fugees. In 1998, the Source magazine voted them the best hip-hop radio show of all time. And I second that opinion, I think along with millions of others. This guest is also an official basketball head and a curator of the sneaker culture, penning his landmark Source article, Confessions of a Sneaker Addict, in 1990. Then, in 2003, became a critically acclaimed author of Will You Get Those, which my kids still say to this day. New York City sneaker culture from 1960 to 1987. In 2005, ESPN, It's the Shoes series, hosted by our next guest, became the first show on the subject in broadcasting history. This basketball head is also a former professional basketball player by ways of Puerto Rico. That's right. He also performed in a groundbreaking Nike freestyle commercial in 1997. And the brand released seven co-designed Air Force One sneakers bearing his name. The voice of EA Sports popular NBA Street video game is also by the world-renowned DJ who has spun soul, jazz, and of course hip-hop at Lincoln Center, Central Park, Stage, and Smithsonian. Let me scratch that hip-hop because he doesn't really spin hip-hop like that, just to keep it real, even though he's a hip-hop legend. As an award-winning filmmaker, he directed Doing It in the Park, Pick Up Basketball, and his latest joint. Let me tell y'all, if y'all haven't seen any of these, Please go check them out, especially this last joint, Rock Rubber 45's T. is an in-depth look inside his amazing life. So, without further ado, help me welcome to the show, hip-hop legend, filmmaker, author, and straight-up renaissance man, Bobito Garcia. You all ready? You ready? You ready? Yes. Yes. yes, you have you just have stepped out into, into the world, world of chaos, chaos. Where, where everybody, everybody goes, goes hard. hard. I, I want to jump right into this, man. Um, I know you've been watching some of the shows. You know how we start this off. Who introduced uh, you to the it, game? Uh, 1,000 with you. I got to say rest in peace to my father, uh, Ramon Garcia, um, who played in Puerto Rico growing up. He was born in 1935. So when he was a teenager, and, you know, this is in the 1940s, a lot of people don't know that the pro league in Puerto Rico is 10 years older than the NBA. We started in... Yeah, we started uh, mm. Baloncesto Superior Nacional, that's the BSN, in the 1930s. And so he grew up like a nut. Like, he's a basketball head, you know what I'm saying, like, for, for PR. And um, he played uh, in Rio Pedras and um, got invited to the, the Cardinals, the Cardenares uh, pro team. Right at that moment, his parents split up. Uh, 1953, he had to move to New York. So he never got to play pro. Uh, out there, but once he got to New York, you know, of course, in the 1950s, you know, the, the scene is alive and he's jumping right in, he, you know, playing ball up West Side, 
you know, whatever park he could go to um, and having, you know, having not always feeling welcomed, you know, the, the, the Puerto Rican experience in the 1950s was, was an interesting one in that we were U.S. citizens, but, you know, there was a lot of prejudice, there was a lot of racist, racism, um, you know, and a lot of uh, classism that, that went on. So, uh, you know, but he used basketball as, as a social tool and, you know, he introduced it to me when I was seven years old. We were living on 97th Street and uh, he was like, yo, come on, come downstairs to the backyard with me. And he handed me the rock and I shot, the first shot I took was on like a, a, a homemade backboard on 97th Street between Columbus and Amsterdam. And uh, the rim was like 10 and a half feet high. Dude. Nobody dunked on that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was like one of them wow. homemade joints, you know? So that was my introduction to New York City basketball. And ever since then, like, it was just always special mm -hmm. to me. I didn't really catch the fever. I didn't catch the like supreme, like, oh my God, this is all I got to do until I was 14 though. So it was like years, years later, but you know, props to my father, props to my brothers too. My brother Ray, my oldest. Thank yes, you, I appreciate that. Uh, my dad. brother Ray played Definitely. for the Gauchos when they were at McBurney Y before they even moved to the Bronx. Yeah, he still got his original wow. Gauchos t-shirt from the 1970s. All these years later, my brother, yeah, my brother Bill, That's he played a lot. Of, he, he didn't play high school ball, but he played a lot of tournament ball. So he was playing in like uh, Duncan PAL, fifth PAL, you know, like more like local tournaments. And so I saw my brothers and I saw my pops, how they loved basketball growing up. And, it, you know, it, it put like the, it put the little idea, at the, it hit the light bulb in my head, you know. But it went full blast when I went when I turned fourteen. That's but you know I, I'm gonna I don't want to go. I could talk for like three hours. Be no 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 because that 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 was gonna be the next question that I asked. Like at what age did you start to take the game serious? Because I know it, it hits a, a lot of people differently. Some people get it younger. A lot of people catch it. You know once they get yeah. in high school or yeah, yeah. after college. You know when, no when doubt. Did you start uh, to take the game question. serious? So you know I play CYO ball at Holy Name. Uh, I made the, uh, I made the, in fourth grade, that was my first, like, organized, um, you know, game. I was, uh, I was playing for the, so we had a, a squad for the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, and I made that squad. But I was, you know, I was a scrub. I was, you know, I was nothing to, I, my jump shot had no form. I had no rotation on my shot. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it was nothing. I remember um, the big deal was uh, when I was in sixth grade, me and, and Reginald Brignoli, we we had a, a a game against Good Shepherd, I think, and we were like the two high scores. And they announced our name on a, on a PA. You know, in the morning they make the announcements. They were like, "Congratulations! You know, we won yesterday." Uh, Bobby Garcia, Reggie Brignoli were the leading scores, and I was like, "Yo!" And I was like, the first time I heard my name, you know, announced attached to basketball. I was like, "Yo!" Word out, like it felt good, you know. Meanwhile, I only had like six points, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah i mean you know uh it was it was baseball it was football it was street hockey it was you know blackula it was ring of lario it was you know it was just everything as in my childhood it was like <laughs> it wasn't basketball and that was it but when i when i went to um a couple of things happened glenn so i was i was an also Okay. Yeah, I'm still here. I'm I was an all star. I was an yeah, all star third baseman in Little League in Central Park, and I had got uh, a scout from the San Francisco Giants to give me a card, and um, I had a hot glove. I was all star like three years in a row, and I was really enjoying baseball, you know. But then, um, my 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 summer before uh, before Brooklyn Tech, you know, I, I I was on a squad, Junior Pony, and I wasn't getting no burn. As, you know, the coach's son was a third baseman, so. You know, that just X me out the spot, I lost interest in it. Then I, I tried out for uh, the baseball squad at Brooklyn Tech my freshman year, and I got cut. And, like, those two incidents were probably two, two of the mm. best things that ever happened to me because I already had an inkling about ball, but then it was like, oh, no, it's, it's all good. Y'all did me a favor. Like, now all I'm going to do is play ball. And my pops was like, yo, like, keep on playing baseball. Like, you're good at it, you know. But I was just like, nah, like, basketball – I mean, you gotta understand. I grew up at the Goat Park. I grew up. I grew up on 97th Street, directly across from the Goat. Now, if people don't know, that's named after Earl Manigault, playground legend, who a lot of people don't know. Of course, you know he his stomping grounds were Harlem, and he played for.
Benjamin Franklin led them to the, uh, yep. the PSAL championship in Madison Square Garden in the early 60s. But Earl lived in the Upper West Side for a good amount of years. So Earl was the conduit for a lot of Harlem ball players to come to 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 our block to 99th Street in, in Amsterdam to the GOAT. You know, um, so I grew up playing against Earl, having him mentor me. I remember the first day he he gave me a nod of like, yo, like you got a nice jump shot kid. Like it was like me and Joe Green passing, you know, the kid, the the the, the jersey in the Coca-Cola commercial. I was like, yo, what? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but you know, I I mean that park was so chock full of ball players. You know, we also had Reggie Carter. Now, I don't know if you remember, but Reggie Yo, come no, on, no, I know, but I, I mean, know you're, you're, you're a little Definitely. bit younger than yes. I am, but, I, but a lot of people don't remember Reggie, you know what I'm saying? But Reggie Reggie was an All-American at St. Yep. John's, and Reggie was really the first player to put Riverside yep. Church on the map. That AAU program starts with Reggie Carter, and he grew, he grew up right down the block. And his brother, Daryl Carter, played at UMass Amherst. Rodney Carter was nice. Like, that whole family had, like, five players, you know, in, in, in amongst their siblings. And so, you know, there was, there was the Carter brothers, there was Earl. And then there was the Ellies, you know, Clark Ellie, who was like a perennial all-star at West 4th Street, you know, the lead point guard for uh, Harlem USA under uh, Coach Bill Motley, and his younger brother, Mario Ellie, who was, you know, first team all city. Uh, and Mario and Clark, we all lived in the same building. We lived in Westgate on 97th Street. So, you know, I went to Holy Name with, with Mario. You know what I'm saying? I used to go to Mario's games when he was at Pine Memorial and they would be pumping Treacherous 3, the body rock on the layup line, you know, and Craig Ware and Darryl Walker was on. I mean, I, you know, those are fond memories of mine. So, you know, I'm 14 and I'm being immersed just in my neighborhood by like, you know, such high level basketball. Forget about it. We had the Riot brothers. Ronnie Riot played at Wichita State. His brother, Tommy, got locked up in Rikers and scored like 100 points. In a, in, a, in a game at Rikers. So I'm hearing all these stories. I'm hearing all these folklore, you know, like, and I'm just like, like breathing it. And, and it's just like, it's just getting me glad I'm getting, I'm, I'm, it's like, yo, okay, yo, I don't want to do nothing but play ball. I don't want to do nothing but play ball. And now uh, I'm at Brooklyn Tech as, as a freshman and I wound up failing seven classes at Brooklyn Tech my freshman year. Cause I'm, cause I was. Yeah. They used to have yeah. uh, first to eighth grade, and then third to tenth. Uh, I'm sorry, first to eighth period, and third to third to tenth period. I was in the third to tenth period, so I, I just started cutting classes. I, I wanted to be out of out of school, playing ball, you know. Anyway, what the real turnaround was in 1981. Uh, I played uh, for Central. Ba I made the squad at Central Baptist. I was never. I played. I tried out for Riverside Church. Got cut. You know what I'm saying? Like I wasn't that nice. You know, I I made like you know more like more like the local community squads. So I played with Central Bath. Oh, I'm sorry, no, nah, I didn't right, right, even before right. Central Bath. I played with Douglas. I played with Douglas Community Center. My coach was uh Kelsey Stevens. His daughter years later played at St. John's and Kelsey was nice too. He played for the Gauchos, he was, you know, respected ball player. But Kelsey taught me a lot about the game. And then I played in the Holcomb Market Memorial Youth League in eighty one. And then forget about it. It was like, oh, I'm official now. You know what I'm saying? Like, I got my purple tournament shirt. You know what I'm saying? I got my ponies to match. I, I, I customized my sneakers, you know, the white on white ponies. And um, and then we played. Which you started doing later on and you kept up doing all the way to high school and, and through, you know, through that, what, you were able to customize, customizing is like a whole. Um, well, but, but we got, we, we definitely customizing get there. is a we whole other, get there. you know, story that, 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 that that takes off, but I started right, right. customizing in the early 70s, early, I'm sorry, late 70s, early 80s, you know. Um, but, you know, it was it was really, uh, it was just mind-blowing to be a part of New York City basketball, you know what I'm saying? Like, I couldn't even really appreciate it until I started traveling um, and started going, you know, out of city, out of state. But, uh, but you know, I had, I had, I had great, Great teammates, you know what I'm saying? I had great experiences. I remember going to Central Baptist uh, camp that summer, and my squad was me, uh, Boo Singletary from um, uh, from Ben Franklin. Yeah. 
Oh, Ben Franklin, yes. Eric yeah, Singleton. yeah, yeah. Eric um, Boo Singleton, yes. Or was it yes. Boo? What? He was a big man. No, it wasn't Boo Singleton. I, whatever his last name was. It was like a big man from Ben Franklin named Boo. We had Ron Mathias, who later became known as, as Terminator. And he yep, wound up yep. leading the nation and scoring in scoring at Ju Juco's. You know, Ron scored 108 at Upper Fun uh, 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 Winter League. I mean, Ron was crazy. I mean, he was nice back then in 81, you know, before he starts, you know, devastating, uh, you know, at the, the world. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm like surrounded by cats that like really, really know how to play. And I don't really know how to play, but like I'm feeding off of that energy I'm seeing, you know. And then by, I'd say like 81, 82 is when I started getting an eye, you know, saying like I finally got rotation on my jump shot. I finally like, you know. All right, let's, let's go back. Okay. Let's go back a little bit to that 81 year, right? What was that first game like in that tournament? Right, you got your first jersey, you know, that first jersey that was from a respectable tournament. You know, you laced up nice. What was that first game like for you? Like, what, what did you feel inside? Besides, you know, being a hype. Let's no doubt. I mean, I was nervous. Aspect of it. You know what I'm saying? Like, playing. I'm playing in Rucker. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't even know who Mr. Hulk and Rucker was. You know what I'm saying? It was like, right. I could smell the, 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 the tournament shirt. You know, when they give you the tournament shirt that first day and it just smells like you can smell the screen and, you know what I'm saying? And, like, it, it was it was exhilarating. I didn't even score. I went scoreless. I was on my donut the whole season until the last game at Dykeman. Mr. Couch was on the score table. I'll never forget that. I, I hit a, a running jump shot. You know what I'm saying? I was like, we're all right, cool. I'm official in New York City basketball now. <laughs> But that was a rough summer, B. I played in the Dome Project. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that tournament. Um, it was on 84th Street, right across from Brandeis in 81. And my first possession, I checked into the game. I ripped this kid. My first possession, and I'm going down. And, you know, I, I, the kid's called a jelly now. I, like, flipped it back, and I went like this to dip it. And Brian Batchelor, you know, he came from, he came from behind. Rubbed me on the board. Ha! Ah! You know, ha! Ah! And I'm like, yo, everybody's <laughs> laughing at me. You know what I'm saying? It's like... Yo, like being a part of New York City basketball is 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 treacherous, B. Like it's it's exhilarating at the same time, you know. I mean, when I was up in Harlem, and no in those times, being a fair skinned Boricua, you know, with a whack haircut, with no hair with no hairstyle really, you know, people didn't really know if I was Puerto Rican, if I was white, or if I was whatever, you know, saying Italian. So they used to be calling me, you know, come on, white boy, you ain't shit, you know. You know, yo, we'll rip that white boy. You know, that white boy would be bothering me. Like, yo, I'm not white. You know what I'm saying? But like, you know, but, you know, you just right, take right, it, right. And, you know, until you get good enough to, to you know, to for, to for them to flip it and be like, yo, don't leave them open. You know what I'm saying? Like, yo, who's guarding them? You know what I'm saying? Like, it took it took a while to get there. But, um, you know, there's a, a very fun times. Man. Oh, another, another great uh, teammate that I had, you know, I was a role player, you know, in these early years. I was always a role player in most tournaments, you know, always a role player. Um, but Richie Simmons, who played at, at All Hollows. Yes, fast. Me and him, we took the chip yeah. and got a Riverside in 80, it was 81 or 82. And that was like, that was like my first chip and then like my only chip for like the next 15 years. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> But Richie was left-handed. He didn't have no <laughs> rotation on his jump shot. He wanted to play in the Iona, but he was so fluid. And again, like, I'm watching Mario Ellie. I'm watching Clark Ellie. I'm watching Reggie Carter. I'm watching Tommy Ryan, Ronnie Ryan. I'm watching Earl Manigo. I'm watching Richie Simmons. You know what I'm saying? I'm watching all these dudes. I'm watching Ron Mathias. And I'm learning, B. I'm taking notes. I'm taking, I'm really, like, absorbing all this, this uh, style. You know what I'm saying? Like, for me, like, style was everything like you could be real nice but if your form was whack like you were whack to me you know what i'm saying like we said you know we said we said <laughs> talk so much smack about dudes in the nba like coming down the left side of the court with their right hand like yo he ain't got no left hand dribble you know what i'm saying like get him out of here you know what i'm saying so right right you know it was all about that and then forget about it be by 82 i went to the wheelchair classic to watch billy donovan Pro Washington, and then my head exploded. Be the first time I saw Pro Washington play, aka Pac Man. He came into the gym, like the game had already started. You know what I'm saying? And forget about it. It was like, like EF Hutton. Like everybody just stopped. Like yo, know, he walked in with a Gaucho's jacket. I remember this vividly. Yeah, black 
and, and orange gaucho jacket with a gold chain said Pac Man on it. Boom. Checked into the game, just oh, oh my God, Pac Man, like pfft. yo. Yo, Bob, you know how many people came on here and the talked about classic? that game? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. That game I mean, you talking about specifically. Yo, Billy Donovan, with, with, yo, with Billy Billy Donovan, Donovan. crossed somebody. He didn't even score. He crossed somebody up. And, the, and like, it was like he scored the buzzer beater in the NCAA, NCAA Final Four. It was just a crossover. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, right, right, know Billy right. Donovan wound up being, you know, NBA player with uh, the Knicks, played at Providence, you know, NBA champions uh, with the, I mean, a co as a coach for Florida uh, when uh, Joaquin Noah was there. But, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, B, there's so much, there's so much inspiration in New York. You know, as a ball player, it was just, I can't contain myself. You know what I'm saying? It's, it was like, yo, like, the only thing I want to do is just play ball. That's all I want. That's and It's not just all that I wanted to do, Glenn. It was all that I did. I ain't have a girlfriend my four years of high school. I ain't have a girlfriend my four years of college. Those eight years, all I did was play ball, my brother. I got to Wesleyan, and I dumbed out again. I started failing classes because I was in the gym playing ball. You know what I'm saying? I was on academic probation. Then I was on strict academic probation. I was on about to get kicked out of Wesleyan because all I was doing was playing ball. I mean, I, I, I turned it around eventually. All right. But, 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 okay. but before, before we get there real quick, like before you left the neighborhood, who was the best player in the neighborhood? Uh, on the Upper West Side, I mean, I think I already mentioned like Mario, you know, Reggie Carter, Earl Manigo, you know. But Reg, I mean, Reggie, Reggie was, was the guy. guy. But Reggie, by the time I was playing, Reggie wasn't playing. He was playing for the Knicks. You know what I'm saying? He wasn't at the GOAT no more. Okay. Um, yes, yes. I mean, there was yes. so many players that would come through the park. I mean, Albert King played at the GOAT. Yeah, but but they were from Fort Greene. Yeah, oh, my God, from the it, it'd be the Ryan yeah, Brothers. Who was the guy? Um, uh, Tommy Ryan, Ron, Ronnie Ryan, and then Ray Diaz. And then Jerry Erasmus. Jerry Erasmi was a okay. walk-on at Syracuse. I don't know if you know who that who he is, but he he was a Jerry Erasmi no, is the dude no, behind no, the right. whole Nike marketing campaigns in the '90s and 2000s. Jerry was the one who who reached out to Ray Diaz to start gotcha. Pro City. Jerry was the one behind the whole City Attack campaign. I mean, he's a legend in in sneaker industry, but he was from the neighborhood, and he was actually Clark Ellie and Mario Ellie's cousin. And for those who don't know who Mario Ellie is, got you, Mario got you. Ellie wasn't just the first team all city at Power Memorial. He went, he goes on to be all American at, at AIC, American International College. And then he wins three NBA chips yep. in the nineties between playing for the Rockets and the Spurs. And he's my neighbor. You know what I'm saying? He lived on the third floor. I knew his sister, Nancy. I knew his dog. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, um He he was the guy, he, he was the guy that did the choke sign, right? Remember that the, the, the infamous choke sign? Did he? I don't even remember that, man. Like, you know, but he was—he was definitely—he was, definitely, was definitely before he left. He was definitely a, a, a street. He would come back to the city and play in the tournaments. He wasn't oh. one of those pros who stayed no, away. No, no, no. He came back Mario and participated. Mario would come back to the neighborhood. He would—he would run with us. You know, he would play in, at West Fourth. He would play in a pro am. I mean, you know, I had to pro am. Oh my God! I used to go to pro am. I used to see Nancy Lieberman play. You know, she was the only woman. Yeah, she was the first Ooh, woman uh, to to have a trial with the de in the NBA. So the first woman to ever get be invited to be drafted by the NBA was she passed away, Lu Lucia Harris. But yeah, Nancy Lieben was, yeah, was actually she, invited she, she to a trial away, yeah. and she went. She tried out for the for the Mavericks, but she was a, a New York City legend. She was the first woman playing in a men's pro rucker. You know, used to play in a pro am. I used to see yeah. her. I used to see Wes Matthews, not Wes Matthews Jr. The father, you know. I used to say Rick, Ray Williams and uh, Gus Williams from Mount Vernon. Um, you know, I used to see all these dudes playing as uh, Sam Worthen in the Pro-Am. I mean, yo, it was like, world be free? Oh, my God. Be like, oh. Um, but, yeah, as far as the neighborhood goes, it would, I would have to go with Richie Simmons as well. Um, who else? Uh, oh, Ray Diaz. Ray Diaz, who winds up starting the Pro City Tournament, and had his own tournament on the Upper West Side as well. But Ray played at Shaney State. Uh, under John Chaney, who later uh, coached at, at Temple and became a, a legend. But Ray Diaz was yeah. nasty, B. Like, Ray Diaz was 
I remember, I'll never forget this, B. I came down on a fast break. I was trailing. And Ray, this is at the goal. Ray ran ahead. Somebody had the ball on the right side and passed it to him in the middle. And Ray, without even looking, tapped it behind his head. And I was like five feet behind. And I was just so shocked that like, yo, how did he see me? You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, again, I'm saying, just, you know, <laughs> these moments in New York City basketball, it's just so magical, so unrehearsed. And it just, it kept on like, you know, just kept on like, you know, if, if it was a bonfire, it just kept on throwing wood, you know, in my, in my, in my fever. I was like, yo, word, like, I want to be nice. I want to be, I want to be like them. You know what I'm saying? Wow. Well, how did meeting Dow Roberts take So Dow Roberts was a cat that, that lived in Douglas Projects as well. I was born in Douglas Projects, but I moved to 97th Street to a building called Westgate. Dow was, was in Douglas. And he um, got accepted to the ABC program, which was a, a stands for a better chance. It's like a minor, minority scholarship program for gifted students. I mean, we don't say the word minority anymore. Back back in the '80s, we said that. So, you know, right. Daryl was the one who put me on. He was like, "Yo, you know, you can apply and you can possibly go away to school." And I was like, "Word, like I want to do that." Oh, so let me backtrack. So, I, Brooklyn Tech, I I made JV my sophomore year and and okay 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 we had two practices mike drake was on it one was on that team too he wanted to play in the aic years later um we were all inspired by lorenzo charles god bless the dead who i was when i was a freshman lorenzo charles was, yeah. was a, a, a a senior he went on to hitting the the winning shot in the 1983 ncaa championship when he was at nc state you know, you want to play in the NBA as well. Big inspiration. Um, when I played in high school at Lower Murray in, in Pennsylvania, I wore number 43 in honor of Lorenzo Charles. You know, because like I, I looked up to him. Anyway, so mm -hmm. sophomore year, we had three practices for JV at Brooklyn Tech. And then the third day, uh, the coach comes in. He's like, I'm sorry to share, but the PSCL has withdrawn the budget for JV. It's a wrap. So that was it. It was like, all right, cool. Yeah, come on. Now I get it, yo, Barbito. Let me explain something to you. For years, I never understood why we didn't have a JV at Lincoln. Because when I got to Lincoln in 83, I was fortunate enough to make varsity, mm -hmm. but I was going to play football, right? We didn't have a JV team. So it was just like, I, I went out for. Uh, to try for the team with my friends because I didn't want to ride all the way across town by myself, right? So I just went out. I was like, yo, they yeah. never won the state. We're yeah, never yeah, going to yeah. make it. We're freshmen. Never thought in a million years my coach would, I would be one of the freshmen that make it. He only picked three mm, players. Mm. The three players were freshmen. One was Josie Watkins. He was the best player on Corny Allen as a ninth grader. The other was Dave Adabanjo. Um, he went to my coach in junior high school. So those two guys had ends. Me and my coach, we talk about it to this day. I was like, yo, coach, how did you know I was going to go to six quarter next year? And then my coach and my assistant and assistant coach had a falling out. I didn't know this mm. because my coach picked me. And then you know, the next year, my coach made him eat those words. He was like, you know, you didn't want Glenn on the team, and look what happened, you know. But I never, you the first person that made me realize why we didn't have a, J a JV because Lincoln had yeah. every team, golf team, swimming team, baseball, the, and they all yeah, of that JV, PSL, but no JV the basketball. PSL was broke, you know, and that happened in 80, ah. that was 81, 82. So, yeah, yeah by the time I got there, it was a wrap. You know, anyway, was so, no JV, I, so I watched so Daryl Roberts, you know, is my man, and he puts me up on ABC. I wound up getting accepted, you know, and I wound up going to Lower Marion High School in Ardmore, Pennsylvania. Now, for a lot of people that might know, 12 years later in 1996, Kobe Bryant gra graduates from Lower Marion and, you know, does what he does, you know, wins all the chips in the NBA, and he puts our school on the map. But we were nice. Right. When In my junior year and my senior year, we won the Central League. My senior year, we were ranked top 10 in the preseason for the state, for Pennsylvania. We kind of choked in the playoffs <laughs> um, in the states, you know, in the, uh, actually in the sectionals. But um, 
but I had a fantastic experience playing in, in, in Pennsylvania. And, you know, in the main line, it was a lot of nice players. But I was going to Philadelphia, and I was doing stupid. Sh like, I wasn't supposed to play in winter tournaments in Philadelphia, playing varsity at the same time, you know. But I was like, yo, I want to play against everybody. So I was going to Philly, and I would, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I'd be playing in, in the tournaments out there and um, in North Philly and uh, – you know, I mean, it was just so many, so many ball players out there. And I remember my coach. Oh, you know what happened was, so in '82, that's when I started developing my hands. I, I made. Do you remember the Big Apple games? Not the Empire State games, but the Big Apple. Oh, the Big Apple are. games. Legendary. So I somehow yeah. made, squeezed yeah. in a spot on the Big Apple games. We had the uh, the tryouts at at, at uh, Brandeis. And my and our coach was a cat named Vaughn. This is 1982, and so Vaughn saw my love. You know what I'm saying? So he would like really work with me because I would get there early. I would get there, I would stay late, and he would just give me like drills, 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 drills. And I want to and 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 so I really took those drills and I just started like, you know, my my handles started coming slowly. You know what I'm saying? I also got to shout out somebody I can't forget, Pete Strickland. Pete Strickland, I met him in 1981. And he he was a a, a, a Dematha product. He had played under legendary coach uh, Morgan Wooten, and um, he went to play at University of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. Broke all the assist records there. Went to Ireland and basically revolutionized the National Pro League out there. Like he's like the Jordan of of Ireland. You know, wow. so he's the first dude to go to Ireland and really, you know, just create interest in that country. But he comes back to, to New York and he moves on to 99th Street and now he's coming to the GOAT. And I don't know that this dude played at Pitt. I don't know he played in Ireland. I don't know nothing. He's just a cool white dude who's playing 21 with me. And he could see, again, similar to Vaughn from Big Apple Games, he could see my passion. So he's like, yo, let me let me teach you a couple of things about quick release jump shots. Because he was also a five-star guy. He winds up coaching at Coastal Carolina years later, you know, conference coach of the year, everything. Pete beautiful dude we still in contact anyway so he teaches me about rotation and quick release and this is in 81 so again like going back to like me being a scrub you know what i'm saying and being like a role player on like community squads you know what i'm saying like i'm slowly getting my game together by the time i get to low Merriam, now the coach out there mike manny he was like yo man like you're doing stuff that none of us can do like you 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 know but I need you to play part of the system, you know? And I was like, all good. Controlled basketball. All good. I'm not trying to break out your play. system. But when he needed a last second shot and the play broke down, he would call my name, like, Rob. They, by then, I wasn't Bobby anymore. I was Rob, Rob Garcia. He'd be like, yo, shoot the ball. We got three seconds. All right, cool. Boom. You know, so um, so my experience at Laura Murray was 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 – beautiful as well and then in between that i was coming back to new york and playing in hokum rucka citywide ryA um dome project got a riverside you know a lot of community tournaments you know i was coming out to uh to best Star. um what was that court uh on clausen and, and um and fulton um yeah it's a big court that's now but back then it wasn't called that you know what i'm saying like biggie wasn't even around yet but you know we used to do workouts there in the mornings with, with you know with cats and stuff and and, um, you know, I would just go everywhere. I would go to Roberto Clemente State Park. You know, I would go to Orchard Beach. I would go to West Forth. I would go to 86. I would go to Cromwell and Staten Island. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was just wherever there was run B, I was going. I was like, I was a pickup nut. You know what I'm saying? Like, I wasn't, like, catching trophies. I wasn't, you know, traveling. None of that. I was a, a dude who just loved basketball. And I'm still that dude at age 55 going on 56, you know. Listen, yo, B, let me explain something to you. Again, watching your film, Rock Rubble 45, it showed me, it just confirmed what an official basketball head you really are. And where, where most guys would have quit and gave up, you kept going. You know, and the, the one thing I was impressed by was your 10 year plan oh, yeah, that yeah, you yeah, wrote yeah, yeah. as a teenager. And I, I pulled, yo, I rewind that back and I paused it. And me and my guys is reading through it. Shout out to my guy. I Pat see Gene Mahone, Smith is up in here right too. Now. Shout out to Gene Smith from the Hoyas. Basketball head from 
Oh, my, my, that's my guy right there. That's Best defender. Out Smith. What up? Oh. A lot of people here, man. But but I, I was impressed by your 10-year mm -hmm. projection plan. And, and I suggest all young guys who see this video, write down your plan and perceive what you want to do. And you could bring that to fruition, man. What, what well, made was, you write you know, that? I was a, uh, there was a, a, a summer camp, a summer day camp called Up With Fun in Harlem that was run by Gene Kitt and Mike Brown. Um, Gene Kitt, God bless the dead, they, 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 they renamed the court on 119th between second, uh, first and second after Gene Kitt after he passed. But the Upward Fund was a phenomenal program. You know, it was like Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to like 3 p.m. During, during the summer. And it was great. It was like you went there, you play ball, you learn, you know, uh, social skills, job skills. We wrote, I, that's where I had my first mock interview. That's where I had to write my 10-year projection. You know, uh, we would have like um, people come talk to us. That's the first time I met Tony Hargraves. He was at, at Iona and he, he was. Shout out to my guy. Yeah, no yeah. Guess Tony, Tony, the show. I remember being a 15-year-old in awe of Tony Hargraves walking in, you know, to the gym to talk to us. It was like 100 degrees in there, you know. <laughs> but, you know, again, like going back to New York, like New York is such a beautiful environment like there's so many programs now that incorporate education uh into basketball programming but you know that was the case back in the 70s and 80s you go back before upper fun yet each one teach one it started in 1965 after mr holcomb right. Rucker passed away you go back to mr holcomb rucker all he did he was using basketball to, to send kids to school that was his main platform he wanted to help people get better educations he, he happened to love basketball and use it to give kids something to do during the summer. But, you know, we have a long history of, of incorporating education with, with basketball and, you know, anyways, I'm a product of that, as, as are you, you know, as are you, as, as we all are, you know, so. Um, Definitely. Listen, and, and go through that, I just want to just tap off some things. Cause again, when, when, when I look at uh, your life through the film and, and the things that I already know about you, um, it just reminds me of, of other ball players who go around the fabric of it, who go around legendary ball players, and a lot of that stuff rubbing off on them oh, no. and, and kind of changing their lives. And, and you kind of had the kind of best of both worlds from the basketball world and the music world, you know. So not too many people could say that they went over uh, Patty LaBelle's house once a month, eight four, and got yeah, to Yeah, I did that in high school. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I. What did that do I mean, for you? What did that you know, do for you? As I detailed in the film, Rock Rubber 45s. It's on Vimeo, it's on YouTube, all that. But basically, you know, Patty, uh, being my host parent uh, in the ABC program at the Law Murrian, you know, just she gave me a, a just a, a just a, a world view, you know, and and a kindness that I think I already had to give to others. But she was so humble with it. Like when I was with Patty LaBelle and her family, I didn't know her as Patty LaBelle the, you know, the pop icon. I just knew it as Patty LaBelle, you know what I'm saying, who's gonna cook mashed potatoes and introduce me to, to shrimp tempura, like, and, and vegetable tempura. Like, yo, she could cook a ass off. And this is before she became known as like, yeah, yeah. Patty the chef and with food products and all that stuff. Like, so, you know, but um, yeah, I, I've lived a very blessed life. Um, but, you know, I, I listen, people look at me, what I did with hip hop, what I've done with sneakers, you know, and I tell everybody like, yo, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't be in those lanes without ball because basketball is what introduced me to hip hop. I probably would have found out about hip hop anyway, but being part of the basketball matrix in New York, like is what connected me to, to like cats in Brooklyn, cats in Queens, you know, and, and I just learned so and got, you know, part of the network. And then when I started working in the hip hop industry, when I started working at Def Jam in 1989, and then when I started doing a radio show in 1990 with Stretch, the fact that I played ball really helped me out. You know, I remember Russell Simmons, the president of Def Jam, founder, you know, he used to talk mad smack to me about ball. I'm like, yo, B. Yo, dead up. I was like, that's all good. I didn't say nothing. You know what I'm saying? I was like, that's all good. And then he, he was like, yo, come on. Let, let's go to, because we used to be on, on Broadway and Bleecker. So he had a, a, a membership at NYU. So I was like, oh, come on. Let's go. So I played one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, I scraped him. 
I scraped him, be like, and I just looked at him like, yo, don't ever talk shit to me about basketball ever again in your life. You know what I'm saying? And after that, he was like, yo, let me buy you a pair of sneakers. You know what I'm <laughs> but, but you know what I'm saying? Like basketball, yo. you know, when people find out you play ball and hip hop, it's like, it makes you cooler. You know what I'm saying? Like it gives you a little bit of an edge, you yes. know? And um, I mean, you know, I wouldn't even, I mean, think about it, B. Like I wouldn't even got my job at Def Jam if it wasn't for the bond that I had with Mark Pearson. Cause Mark Pearson introduced me to Pete Knights. You know who played at Bishop Ford was all Brooklyn Queens. Pete Nice introduced me to Search, and it's Pete Nice and Search who formed the group Third Base. They get signed to Def Jam, and they're the ones who give me the job as a messenger at Def Jam, and that's my entry point into the music industry. Now, if I don't play ball, I don't meet Pete, I don't meet Mark, and I don't get the job at Def Jam. You know what I'm saying? So it's like it's so it's so it, there's so much levels to you know to my passion for basketball, and then even when I was working at Def Jam. And even when I was on a radio show with Stretch for eight years, you know, if people don't know, I introduced the world with Stretch to unsigned Nas, unsigned Biggie, unsigned Wu Tang, unsigned Eminem, uh, uh, up and coming Jay Z, up and coming Fuji's, unsigned Big Pun, unsigned Mob Deep, unsigned uh, Big L. I mean, I could go on and on and on, you know. Yo, first of all, okay. Bob, let me. I'm gonna go back mm. one, and I'm gonna come up another one, and then we're gonna go right back into you. I don't think you remember. I, Pete Nice and I played oh, on the Empire oh. State games together. I was on the I was the high the only high school kid that was on that team. Myself, Ross Strickland, Boo Harvey, Derek Chivas, Boo Harvey. I mean, uh, Pete Nice, uh, Dwayne Shake Martin, uh, Eric wow. Johnson, Vinny Microwave Johnson, brother, and Pete was telling us he was going to become a rapper. <laughs> <laughs> we were just like, oh, whatever. He was like, no, seriously. Yeah. I got Russell Simmons' number. Yeah. I got his number in the phone book. Pull out the phone book and show his Russell number. We still just yeah. like, man, you making that up. I get the college third base album drop, and he got the whole. If you got the third base album and look in the back, I should have told you to bring it out because I know you probably great, have it. That's in the great. Must of the archivist that you are. Look on the back of the album, you'll see the whole Word. team. Is on the on the back of the album. Facts, facts. And now we we'll move up one. When you talk about uh, unsigned Jay Z, after college, you know I don't get to go overseas. I gotta take care of my nieces, so I'm back in New York, and I'm dabbling in the music. We over Big Daddy K house. Jay Z knocks at the door, and he says, uh, "I want you to come up to the Stretch Armstrong and Barbito show." And brings us with him. He's like, y'all got my guys here. They rap. He was like, ah, oh, bring them, bring them. Let's go. And that night was an amazing night because you you saw the teacher mm -hmm. pass the torch mm -hmm. to the student, right? And, and it just happened to be on your show. Yeah. And this is before his yeah. album dropped. So those things, man, I would never forget. And I repeat them on the show all the time, man. Nah, so, nah. I mean, again, thanks listen, to you, my brother. You know. And basketball, because basketball is the reason yeah, why I Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you remember this, anyway. but we were teammates on Coach Sid Jones, God bless the dead, United Brooklyn, right? Yes, yes, and, um, yes. This is like, um, yes, yeah. Um, I guess early 90s or mid 90s. Yeah, and um, we, we had a squad yeah, in the East yeah, Orange yeah. Pro-Am. And, uh, you know, again, like, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't a starter. I wasn't a guy that was getting double figures, triple, you know, triple double, nothing. I was just a role player off the bench. You know, I come in, I get my little highlight pass, whatever alley oop, and I hit my little, you know, my long range threes. Um, but I hold those experiences so dear because if you remember our squad, it was me, you, Kenny Bantam, who was all time leading scorer at Cornell, yeah. Buck Jenkins, all time leading scorer at Columbia, Dedrick yes. Irving. Kyrie's father, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, we had the big Back. man from uh, St. John's, I forget his name. Um, and then uh, one day, uh, I don't know if you were there that day, but Conrad McCray played with us, you know? And uh, I'll never forget. Yeah, Big Rad. Big Rad, I mean, rest you know, in peace, facts. I'll never forget. Rad was, he told me before the game started, he said, yo, he said, if you see my, my thumb on my waist to the going to the right, Throw that, just throw it up in the air going that way, and I'm going to curl that way. If you see it on the left, 
And that was our little, I mean, I guess he had that with, you know, Syracuse and everything. So I was like, all right, cool, all good. And the first play down, I, yep. saw, the, I saw the little thumb on his waist go. And I said, okay, boop, there it goes. Threw it up. Rad caught that like, ah, yo, he dunked. He, Rad used to dunk so hard, be Like, Conrad McCray was like, Ugh. And then he would dunk, and then all the muscles would be like, Rrr, you know what I'm saying? Like, so, I, you know, I had such, such beautiful experiences. And then I would go from East Orange Pro-Am and then play at, like, a local tournament, like, you know, Ham Fish or Maverick Towers, and I would do work. I was always doing work in like this, like if, if you if you broke down the tournaments in New York, there was like D1 was like EBC, Dykeman, you know, West Fourth, Pro City. Right, right. I was able to get on some of the teams there and just be a role player, you know, off the bench. But then I would go to like the D2 and D3 leagues, you know what I'm saying? And like, <laughs> busy, you know what I'm saying? And it was, it was wonderful um, to, to play against such high level comp, you know, and at least be respect, respect, respectable, you know, um, and then go to the lower level comp and, and you know, and really, like, take it out on them, you know, um, and then forget about it. And then and also it was, like, going to play pickup. You know, I would go play pickup, and it's like, all right, I just came from playing at Pro City, you know, like, having to guard a, a dude who was 6'4", you know, overseas. Like, what do you think I'm going to do to you who's like a dude my height and my weight in the park. You know what I'm saying? Like, and it wasn't even just right, like, right. like, it wasn't even um, a skill thing. It was just like a mental thing. You know what I'm saying? It's like mentally, you're like, yo, like, you can't guard me. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, 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 it's so incredible how key mental fortitude is, you know? And like I went through the through the eighties being a scrub. I mean, I wanted to play in pro ball in Puerto Rico, you know, by eighty seven I I got I got like, okay, I could play, you know. And I played pro ball in Puerto Rico. Um, and then I played in a bunch of tournaments in the nineties and stuff, but uh I played for Power One O five um for a while, you know, semi pro. Uh they had like a team that would travel and stuff. Theo used to run that and you know mm -hmm. we would we would go we would you know destroy teams like it would be like you know PTA games and stuff like that but um but it was really like in my 40s Glenn it was like the weirdest thing B in my 40s I started getting recognized for being a ball player globally like because I never stopped you know saying like I'm, like the passion right. was so strong and I mean it's still it's still pushing me now like I just never stopped playing. So by the, when I'm starting playing the 40 and over leagues, now it's like what I couldn't do in the 80s, you know, which was play against Rod Strickland or play against Gus Williams. I wasn't nice enough. Now I'm playing the 40 over leagues and I'm playing against Boo Harvey. And, you know, I'm 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 playing all right. You know what I'm saying? Like I made the all-star team at Gershwin, uh, the 40 and over almighty force. My man Shaw ran that. Uh, I made the all-star team in Pelham Fritz in Harlem, 40 and over. And uh, I hold these moments, again, right. I hold them so dear because it's like, you know, I went all these decades. I made an all-star team in West 4th in 2009. I was 44 years old. You know what I'm saying? It was like the weirdest thing. You know, it's like, I couldn't have done that in the 90s and my 30s. I couldn't have done that in the 80s and my 20s. You know what I'm saying? I mean, granted, the, the comp at West 4th dropped after the 2000s, you know? So I got better and the comp got got a little bit, you know, lower skilled. That's not to knock West Forth. It's still an amazing tournament. No, no. But I think sometimes, I think sometimes people on the outside looking in can, you know, uh, see it differently, right? Because your name is, is brought up in a lot of conversations. Um, you have all these films out. Uh, you help guys, a whole bunch of guys mm -hmm. in these Nike commercials like myself, which, you know, always indebted. But let's let's sidetrack for a minute and, and talk about some of the uh flack you probably have caught because of the the amount of work you've done, mm -hmm. you know, helping the culture and, and the love that you have for the game and people seeing it as something else. No. Or or maybe, you know, people have said that you was a you know, we talk about that like 
of, of being a legend. Right. And other guys like, how was he a legend? And I, you know, I go, I don't yeah, yeah, know no, that so he looked let, at himself it, like I'll that. say it for you and I'll say it for other people. And I've, and I've corrected people in, in interviews. I am not a legend as a ball player. I'm a dude who could play, who has fundamentals, who has wowed the crowd. You know what I'm saying? I have, I've gotten my oohs and ahs in Harlem and Brooklyn, Queens, all that. You know what I'm saying? In Bronx, you know, I've made all-star teams, but that don't make me a legend. You know what I'm saying? Like, when I think of legends, when I was coming up, it was like, okay, Earl Manigault is a legend, you know? Like, everybody has different um, definitions for legend. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know. True, true. And that's also in the, the, the eye of the beholder. Because somebody can think someone's a legend. Absolutely. I'm not, saying, you know, you like, know there's people who are legendary uh, because they were, you know, because of their longevity of their career. You know what I'm saying? Like, I've been playing pickup basketball since 1973. You know what I'm saying? Like, do the math. You know what I'm Like, that's 51 Ooh. years of playing pickup. Ooh. That don't make me a legend. That makes me a veteran. You know what I'm saying? Um, I played ball in 49 countries throughout six continents. That doesn't make me a legend. Mm. That makes me very experienced. So now I'm an experienced veteran, right? Um, I've had the pleasure of playing alongside legends, Speedy Williams, Future. We've been t teammates. We've been opponents, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, Jack Ryan, you know, I've been coached by legends. I remember when I was playing for Power 105 at Gershwin one night, and Fly Williams was our coach. And Fly was like, yo, keep, yo, every time you touch the ball, shoot. He was like, straight up. He was like, yo, you have the geezer. <laughs> yeah, that's that's yeah, the guy, Fly. Fly was like, that's yo, you have the geezer, a.k.a. The, the crowd pleaser. You know what I'm saying? I remember Pee Wee Kirkland, the first time we met him, was on a set of Above the Rim. You were on the purple, you were on the purple squad, and yeah. I was on the orange squad. That, uh, again, uh, again. Thank you, Barbito. Appreciate that. Uh, another gift from you, Look, fam. I look uh, out for people's yeah, best possible, right? Yeah. So, you know, um, but I remember meeting Pee Wee Kirkland back in 95 at Julia Richmond. That's where they had the trials for the for the movie, Above the Rim, for people who don't know, you know, featured Tupac. It was about, had Dwayne Martin in it, in it, and Leon and everything. It was a great movie. Um, and I was an extra. I was an extra in, in the film, you know, as were you. And, um, but I remember, I remember, um, yeah, you know, me and Pee Wee wound up becoming tight because we did a lot of Nike commercials together. You know, I was I was casting Nike commercials. I was helping casting agents, uh, you know, uh, get players for for commercials, and I was always looking out for the community. You know, um, and I always have. Now hold on, let me just say this. Let me say this mm -hmm. too, Bob. Because let me back this up with what you said. See, because a lot of people get in position of power mm -hmm. and they close the door, right? We I seen that done so many times. I've seen that so many times, and they want all the power, they want all the shine, and they make sure they're always up front. And I, as y'all hear me say, yo, thank you, Bob. You're the reason why I was mm -hmm. here. You're the reason why I got to do this. And, and it just branded my horizon on things that I was going through. A lot of people didn't know what I was going through at that time, mm -hmm. and those things helped me. You know what I'm saying? Like going through, mm -hmm. you know, losing my mom, taking mm -hmm. care of two girls right after college. Those things were things that help keep me going and keep my mind straight to know that, listen, people can hear me on the radio. This is because of Barbito. Oh, I saw you in Above the Rim. Mm -hmm. That's because of my guy Barbito. Like, this is a true story. And I and I could say a lot of other positions where people have closed the door, but you and, have and opened so, so many. Going back to the idea of people calling me legendary, right? So I also was the announcer for NBA Street Volume 2 video game, which to this day is considered the greatest video game in basketball history. Like this, it, it's, you know, it's just, mm. it's incomparable. You know, it sold millions of copies. And I remember um, there was a kid in, in our neighborhood that used to play the GOAT and he told, uh, Clark Ellie had told him that, that Clark Mario's older brother, God bless, he, pa he passed. But uh, Clark had told the kid, oh, yeah, Bobito, that, you know, he grew up in, he grew up right across the street. He used to play here. And the kid was like, oh, wow, yo, Bobito's a legend. And Clark was like, nah, Bob, Bob isn't a, a legend. You know what I'm saying? Like, and um, and then the kid told me that Clark had said that. And I was like, I was like, yeah, he's right. Like, I'm, I'm a hip hop legend. I'm a sneaker legend. I'll take that. But as a ball player, I'm not a legend. 
I'm a cat that, that caught respect from a lot of legends. Right, right. And I'm a legendary announcer because of the video game. I'm a legendary contributor because I also founded Bounce Magazine, which existed for six, seven years. I directed the film behind me, doing in the park, which to this day is the only film that ever documented New York City pickup basketball. It's the only film that's ever done it. You know, and we crushed it. You know, it was on Netflix, it was on PBS. So I've contributed, I've contributed. No, nah, awesome film. That, that was I've the first contributed film to the I game on a very that. large scale. You know, I've consulted Museum of the City of New York for the city game uh, exhibition. I've consulted Nike, I've consulted Wyden Kennedy, I've consulted, I mean, NBA, I mean, you know, you name it. I've done, I've done so much in so many levels. So as a contributor, I've, I've helped elevate and inspire the game. That doesn't make me a ball player of legend. When I think of legends, legendary ball players, I think of Jack Ryan. I think of Speedy Williams. I think of um, Master Rob. I think of Ted Dog, uh, Lamont Thornton, his brother, Mike Boogie Thornton, you know. And those are dudes who are like, you know, entertainers. Then I think about Seth Marshall. I think about uh, uh, Derek Canada. You know, to Seth Marshall. There were Canada who dominated, right. you know, New York for like a good five, six years until his, you know, his knee. Prime time, do it. Corey, do you remember Corey Williams? Showtime, not, Corey not Showtime homicide. Williams. Not homicide. Yo, hold on. Listen, salute to my guy, Shane, the journal machine. My guy, my, my friend, I'm going to call him that because we talk all the time. We, we was talking about uh, Corey the other day and when I used to look back at the, the, the New York City Legends and see Corey Hamasai Williams, this is before I was familiar with him. Because, of course, I missed those years being in the music. Mm -hmm. I, I, I went away from the basketball. But this was Corey Hamasai Williams was doing his thing. And I was like, that's not Corey Williams. Well, let me say, Bobby, uh, just yeah, well, let Corey me first Williams, talk about Corey Hamasai Williams because he was in my film during the park, pick up basketball. He, oh, no, no, no. He get his props. He get his prop. He was there. Yeah. I, I, got, I have him on the show. Bona he got a chance to tell the story. Bonafide and I legend. I salute him all the way. But the first Corey Williams that I knew, and I explained to him, was Corey now, Williams. So Corey Showtime Williams Brooklyn. is the only dude I've ever seen, pro, playground, high school, college, no matter what, that can make somebody jump off of a hesitation in the air, not once. But twice, his hesitation yes, his yes, yes. was so crazy that he would get you in the air. He lets you come back down. He take another dribble, do the hezzy again. You go back up in the air, and then he then he lay you. I get it. That doesn't happen, B. That's a, I, and I'm not making that up. I can tell you. No, no, nah, nah, you're right. You, I can tell you, he did that in the south eastern corner of West Fourth Street. The, the the corner of the court that's right by the handball court. I, I'm, I'm telling you this off of yep, memory. Yep. I watched it myself. I was like, yo, how did he just catch that dude twice with the head? Not once, twice. And not and, and this is in the 90s, again, when West 4 had like Anthony Mason playing in it and Sam Worthen playing in it and like, you know, every Howie Hudson playing in it. Back, Gene Smith, you know, I'm, I'm yep. talking about when West Forth was like, damn well, like, like. First of all, he was playing with Anthony Mason, who was on the Knicks, and they was referring to Corey Williams. No, no, you know, Corey, like he was Corey the guy. Was dropping 30, 40 at West Forth, like, and dunking on dudes, and hitting jumpers on dude, and, you know, yeah, I mean, Corey, Corey Short, Showtime Williams, like, definite. But, so, you know, so now we talk about legends, right? Like, how long did Corey do that for? Did he do it for 10, 15 years? Did he do it in every single borough? Did no, he do it no. at, at certain tournaments? You know, it's like, it's very hard when, when the conversation of legendary, what is the criteria, you know? And everybody has their own criteria. And so, you know, if people are talking about me as a legendary ball player, maybe they saw me playing pickup at Thompson Square Park and at the GOAT and at, 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 uh, at Broward and you know, and at, at, at 113 and, and Fort Green, and maybe they like, yo, that dude's a legend. Like, he destroyed everybody in these three-on-threes and five-on-fives for 20 years. Now, to them, I, like, if they want to say that, I'm not going to be like, nah, chill. You know, 
but I, it's it's a it's a different level. It's like like when people say legend, it's like it's not always qualified. But like a legendary tournament player, is it a legendary pickup player? Is it a legendary high school player? You know, there's dudes who were legendary high school players that didn't really play tournaments or didn't play pickup. You know, so facts. You know, a guy like that. Speedy, Speaking of Corey Hamasal Williams, he said he would purposely play on the team that was trash so he could become the man to play against the best players. I I I I said that's a great strategy. People could say that's Corey because he's not winning, but he put himself in position no, he, to be talked about. No, he he I got, think that's genius. Listen, there was a run two weeks in a row at Pro City. Corey had 40 plus on Smush Parker. And then, like, the next week, he had 40-plus on Ron Artest. And at that time, Ron was the NBA Defensive Player of the Year. So imagine. And Smush was the starting guard on the Lakers. And Corey was smart. He, was on, he wasn't on bum squads, but he wasn't on the squad that was going to take it. But that, that said or not, yo, he, he still had 40 on, like, the best defenders in the world. You know what I'm saying? So that puts Corey Homicide in a light that's very special that a lot of people can't really put themselves in. You know, there's a lot of legends that, you know, they might be legendary for their, for their entertainment quality, you know, but there's dudes that like did it to, you know, no matter where they were or no matter who they were guarding against, you know, there's certain cats who were legends uptown and they come to Brooklyn and they, they wouldn't get that type of, um, you know, they wouldn't get those types of numbers or they, they even get the ref calls or whatever. Yeah, let me tell you, let me tell you, I, when I, I always tell dudes to come on here that's from different boroughs, the Brooklyn guys had to go everywhere to play. Not too many people came to Brooklyn to play. And we talking about the legends and those guys who were great. A lot of them didn't come to Brooklyn. And when they come on here, I used to always say, like, where was you mm -hmm. guys? Why was you guys not coming to Brooklyn? And, of course, the, 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 the myth of the streets and not being able to leave and where some of the tournaments were held, I get it, but... I nah, no doubt. New York no doubt. Tough I mean, there's, there's legends, you know, there's local legends, there's neighborhood legends, you know, there's all city legends, and then there's all world legends, you know what I'm saying? Like, Pee Wee Kirkland is an all world legend. Like, you just, you can't refute that, you know? Um, uh, you know, to me, Speedy is an all city legend, you know what I'm saying? Like, he's, like, I saw Speedy at, at Springfield, I saw, I saw Speedy in, 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 uh, Orchard Beach, I saw Speedy at, like, I, Speedy used to play in the three-on-threes. Like, you know, there was a lot of dudes who only played five-on-five. Five. Speedy was playing everywhere. He was playing, and, and he Speedy, played a Speedy was still winning too. MVPs in his 40s. To me, that's like a real, real legend. You know what I'm saying? Right, like a real right, legend. So, right, right. you know, but look, yeah. I mean, I'll say it for you. Anybody out there that's like, yo, he ain't no legend. Like, no, I'm not a legend. I'm not a ball player legend. All right? So, Relax. <laughs> I never said I was. If other people are saying that about that, <laughs> that about me, don't get, don't get mad. Just teach them, you know what I'm saying? Teach them about what it means to be a legend as a ball player. But, you know, when it comes to being on the mic and when it comes to contributing to the game and having a passion, I feel like I, I don't know a lot of people who have done it as much as I have for New York City playground basketball, you know? And that's why, you know, brands and cultural institutions they keep on knocking on my door because they know what i've done for this culture you know and i've spread it you know what I'm saying like i've been to other continents you know i went to africa uh sponsored by the state department you know to senegal uh with for a program called seeds um it was uh sports education and uh, economic development senegal you know and i went to like six different uh cities throughout senegal giving basketball clinics you know, and they wanted me to come out there to spread the culture, not just, you know, teaching basketball, but like basketball culture. And the reason, there's a reason why, because, you know, I've been embedded in this, you know, evangelizing that it's not just a sport, it's a culture, you know, it's, a, it's an experience. So, um, and you didn't, and you didn't I've never, it either. You know what I mean? Like, that, like I said before, no. you didn't whore it. And speaking of going around the country, Kamani does karate said, how did you get to Antarctica though? I said six continents, not seven. <laughs> yeah, I know. I just had to say that because you just mentioned you just mentioned all the places you went to. And I was like, I, 
I would just go and pin this and, and, and say this, you know, this is definitely a great segue. Uh, I want to let everybody know who hasn't done so already. Please go to the YouTube page and subscribe. Please go yeah, to I the YouTube see the page comments. Be and subscribe. Oh, we, we've been on there a year and a half, and we've been doing this for two years. So please help us. I want to see friends. the comments. Thank I haven't you. been able to read the comments. My, my comments are like frozen. I don't know what people are asking or what people are saying. They're, 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 they're saying a lot, and it's been moving so fast. Uh, I'm a pen okay. as, and then you can check them out. Could I hope so? I don't be know. Able to my, see my, once I I, the pen I got right now is Big Red Man seventy one seven one eight Duck Salute Basketball Heads. That's all I see. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. Um, your 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 because I got one right now. It says uh, Fish NC said the Basketball Hall of Fame has contributions of the game. And they still were okay. All cool, famous. Cool, cool. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah, contributor to the game. You know, I, yeah, I'm a, I'm a contributor. Yeah. That's, that's what I want to. I, I don't mind being remembered as a contributor. You know, I don't mind being remembered as a ball player either. You know. Um, right, right. Look, look. Uh, people get uptight for a lot of things. Yesterday, I put up a post um, about the top, some of the top, not the top. I found this article that has some of the top mm. girl basketball players in New York City, mm -hmm. right? Who played high school. I said, wow, I'll put it up and I'll say, who mm -hmm. else did they forget on this list? Like, yeah. and who else needs to be on here? And you said, Barbito, it got so yeah. many, I think over 100 some comments. People just like, put respect on my name. How come I'm not on this list? Why are you posted things like this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah, you put it up for discussion. Why I mean, look, everybody time? has everybody has an opinion. I mean, you know, and everybody has their experiences, and they're all valid, you know. And it's great for you to provide a platform for people to express themselves, you know. If somebody's mad that you're interviewing me, then that's good. I'm I'm happy that that they. That... Oh no no no! I I, I wouldn't say that. I, I I didn't get any calls about people being upset I'm okay, interviewed. Okay. That's that's not the case. Uh we we talk about, you know, some of the, you know, we, we just discussed it. And I don't think it was just a mad thing. They just wanted yeah. it to be clarified. And I I said what you said, because I, I know you and I know uh the kind of person you are. You're not somebody that goes no around patting yourself in the back. And again, you open the doors and you spread the love unlike a lot of people who there don't do that. Yeah. No. And, and and hopefully one day, I know it's gonna happen because God's like, uh, what deserve to get you the the to be the guy who's talking about New York City basketball and how you get all these players up here? Who you put the work, I, yo? You put I'm, the work. I'm in cool. I, I'm, I, yo, brother. Listen, the relationship that uh, I've gone in, uh, you know, throughout the years, my guy. When I was talking to you on the phone, he was just leaving. And right before I left, he was like, wow, that's amazing. Like, you could just get on the mm. phone and call Barbito Garcia. Who can do that? And I was like, he's my, he's, he's, regular guy. He's, my, he's my dude, you know what I mean? But again, in, in his eyes, you know, he's from mm -hmm. Detroit, so I, I understand my guy, right? He's seeing it from a whole different lens than a lot of people in New York City. And and we got people that, uh, again, me and Shane talking about people carrying these egos. The ball play ego mm -hmm. is, is something different. Right, especially in New York City, you know, it's like mine, 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 yeah. and it can't be nobody else's. But you, you have talk about some of the players you have highlighted throughout your films. The films wasn't about you, the 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 rock, uh, the rock rubber forty five. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. basically yeah. the story of your life. Yep, you know what I'm saying in a nutshell. But so the my other, first, my first you know, film, the uh, doing it in the park and the other playground documentary that you yep. put out was highlighting yep. so when I did um, the game. I started Bounce Magazine in, in 2003 at the time there wasn't a year round publication documenting playground basketball and I felt like that was like that was a void that needed to be filled you know so uh, I actually happened to be the first person on the cover and it wasn't by my design um, and it wasn't a statement but the, pe the two people who founded the magazine was Sean Couch and Jesse Washington um Sean Couch, who had played in CBA, mm. had been drafted by the Knicks, uh, you know, son yeah. of Mr. Couch, who's run Eichmann, you know, 
Mr. Couch was yeah. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's first coach, uh, period, like back in the 1950s. Um, so that's a that's a family of, of ball players, uh, very rich um, folklore in the city. But anyway, so Sean and Jesse asked me to be on the cover of the first issue because they felt like I, I embodied the spirit of New York City outdoor basketball. I was like, cool. So the second issue, we I was like, yo, let's put Junie Sanders on the cover. Because at that time, like, Junie was like everything. You know what I'm saying? Like, Junie was running New York. And also Junie had, had won, um, him and Mike Campbell had won uh, the first uh, Nike Battlegrounds one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, you know, Battleground one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. So yeah. we put Junie on the cover early on. We put uh, Bone Collector on the cover early on. We put Hook Mitchell on the cover early on. Hook, we've, this is before Hook Mitchell's documentary had even come out. And the idea of putting a, a, a person who was incarcerated on the cover of a magazine was, was like, Slam wasn't going to do that. And I mean, I'm not knocking Slam or Sports Social, but you know, like no other magazine was going to do that. The other thing that we did at Bounce that was, was groundbreaking was uh, I, I told Jesse and Sean, I was like, yo, like, we can't be an outdoor playground magazine having indoor photo shoots. That don't, that, you know what I'm saying? That don't make no sense. <laughs> We got to shoot people outdoors. Right, right. And so right. there was a lot of pushback because Jesse was the managing editor at Vibe. He was the, he was the editor in chief of Blaze Magazine. You remember those magazines in, in you know the nineties and two thousands. So he had a lot of publication experience, and I was like, nah, I'd be like, yo, right. let's shoot it outdoors. So we had Hook Mitchell jumping over of a car. This was in like two thousand and four, two thousand and five. When that cover came out, it shook it shook the entire industry. Dime Magazine. Their next issue, they want to put in, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Chris, uh, Sky, Sky, Sky Rider. I oh, forget his name. He won a bunch of dunk, dunk contests in 2005, 2006. But they put him at ABC, Rucker Park, jumping over a car after they saw our cover. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, we want to put. Now, hold on. Was this before Book's documentary that you guys put about? Who's documentary? Book. Uh, the the guy Hook. from yeah uh, yeah California. yeah yeah this is before his the, documentary the guy, came. Uh, we we had him on the cover of, of there you of go Miles. there we had you Spurs go Park on the cover we had Kyrie Irving on the cover this is before he was even like a star in high school so we were like very much like on a cutting edge magazine and we lasted for like six seven years and then we went under you know what I'm saying the, the publication business is very difficult I was editor in chief very proudly of it uh, for you know a good amount of of the issues uh, we put Jack Ryan on the cover. You know, deservedly so. We put Mike Campbell on the cover, deservedly so. We put Kareem yeah, Reed yeah. on the cover, deservedly so. You know, these are all you know legendary cats. You know, and 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 I was honored to to work with them to you know to curate the photo shoots and and the, and, the, and the features and everything. So those are just you know a few of the people that we had. And then I did my film doing it in the park. We doing it in the park, pick up basketball NYC, and um in that film you know I really want to to document this beautiful uh, ceremony, you know, this be beautiful movement that's gone global, but it's so centered in New York. You know, it's so centered. I, yo, like I said, I've been to 49 countries, my dude. I've been to countries where until you hear the person speak, you're like, oh, homeboy's from New York. And it, they don't talk a lick of English. Right, and you're like, right. yo, how is that? And it's like, it's because New York has been packaged, marketed, and sold to the world. And I saw it. I was part of it. I'm part of the. Re I'm one of the people in the matrix behind the scenes that created that. You know, because of my consulting work with Wyden and Kennedy and Nike. You know, um, but you know, it's it's been beautiful to see. And uh, so anyway, in doing it in the park, you know, we featured Corey Homicide Williams. Uh, we featured Jack Ryan. We featured Fly Williams, Pee Wee Kirkland, Earl Manigo. But it wasn't just about like all the superstars, you know, playground cats. It was about the the normal dudes, you know, uh, 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 the cat at, at Tillery Park that goes there Saturday mornings and Sunday mornings at 6.30 a.m. for the for the five on five run that's been going on for decades. You know, uh, Vincent Matos uh, from, from Brownsville, you know, in, in East New York. We went out to the cage in, 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 uh, in Brownsville, his little Sunday morning run with all his cats and you know, we interviewed him, you know what I'm saying? We wanted to just get like the, the people who are really dedicated out there. You know, we went to, there was a, a, a hearing impaired run in Harlem. You know, that's one of the best scenes in the entire film. Um, wow. And I, I, I found about, out about them because I used to ride my bike looking for a run. 
throughout all the boroughs. Yeah. And when I found them, I was like, oh, they hear every, I don't want to say, because it's like a sacred game. But one of the dudes spoke, you know, he used to have his hearing before he lost it. And I asked him, he spoke well enough, he could read lips. And he, I was like, yo, can we come here and film your run for our film? And he was like, yeah, 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 come. And forget about it. When, they, when we brought the cameras, they were so happy be, to, be, to be like, to be seen, you know what I'm saying? And for me, that's, that's what it's always been about. Yeah, I'm gonna talk about, you know, the playground legend, but I wanna talk about the unknown cat too. And the sisters out there too. You know, we had Nikki Avery in our film, you know, Samara Marsh. Um, uh, yeah, Gigi, been on the uh, show. Uh, yeah. Alani Malik, you know what I'm saying? Like I wanted, to, I, wanted to, I wanted to really have like, yo, this is New York City playground basketball. It ain't just men who are legends, you know, who don't, who wanna disc discount everybody else. The, the pick up basketball ain't about that. It's about being a part of it. You know, it's about being, you know, and then from that, I started my tournament, Full Court 21. Cause I was like, yo, like I, I got to know so many people around the world that will come to New York and they'd be like, yo, I want to play in West Forth. I want to play in Rucker. You can't go to West Forth and Rucker and just play in a tournament. Unless you like six foot nine and you show up and you dope and you, you know, brolic and then somebody gonna be like, yo, we ain't got enough run with us. But if you five foot 10 and you from Poland and you show up there with some dope sneakers, ain't nobody gonna be like, yo, my man, we ain't got enough run with us. Like, nah, you five foot 10. So I want to create a tournament that was an environment that was gonna be inclusive and when you play 21, there's no teams, there's no teammates, you know what I'm saying, ain't no coaches. You don't have to be uh, part of Brooklyn USA since you're, you know, uh, going to St. John's Rex since you're like seven years old. You, you can come to my tournament and just sign up and play. And there ain't never been a tournament like that in New York's history. All right, now hold on, time out, because I want you to explain this because you know who put me on to this? Oh, Mike Evans. Court Peace. Salute to Mike Evans, yep. my partner on yep. the board of, of Full Court Peace. He was just telling me, he's like, yo, did, did Barbito ever tell you about his Full Court 21? And I was like, okay, nah. And I'm going 21, 21 half court. I was like, hold on. He, he does that full court? He was like, Glenn. Yeah, so, ahead, explain it, so I basically, I'll tell you how, how it happened. I, my man, Manny Maldonado, who's a coach, he used to be at the boys club in, in, in El Barrio in Spanish Harlem. And he invited me down to open room one day and he was like, yo, to warm up, we're gonna play full court 21. I was like, word, cause I love 21. I love being guarded by two, three people. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, like if I could score against two, three people, then I, I really know like, you know what I'm saying? Like, okay, I did something really creative there. Every single right. play, you know? So we ran full court 21 and it just, yo, it blew my mind. And I was like, yo, I. I got to do this as an organized context because no one had ever done. There's been one-on-one -on -one tournaments. You know, the, the first one-on-one -on -one tournament that I know yeah. of ever in the world was Nike Battlegrounds in 2002. Guess who the announcer was? Yes. Me. Yes. Guess who consulted Nike on that? <laughs> Me. You Don't understand? Don't talk, Bob. <laughs> the first tournament of champions in New York was in 2006. Guess who consulted that? Me. Guess who was the announcer of it? Me, guess who told Nike? Yeah, me, guess who told that's Nike to who? do it at the GOAT, at the legendary GOAT tournament, uh, GOAT playground. Me, you know what I'm saying? And it was the winners of Pro City, West Forth, Hoops in the Sun, and uh, and 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 Dykeman, I think, uh, the four Nike sponsored tournaments at that time, you know. Anyway, so you know, I, I, I've been a part of a lot of beautiful things, and I was like, yo, like, no one's ever done an organized context of 21. You got three on three, hoop it up. You got, uh, uh, um, there was a two on two tournament that we did with Bounce Magazine called Truth Dead Consequences. You know, you got all the incredible five on five tournaments. You know, I played in Caton Park. I played in uh, Starrett City. I played in, I mean, I played in so many tournaments. Uh, Brownsville Park uh, in Queen, uh, um, um, not Brownsville. Um, What's the name of that? I forget the name of the tournament. But you know what I'm saying? I, I, East Orange. I mean, I played in so many tournaments. Be like little tournaments, big tournaments. It don't matter. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I love basketball. But, yo, no one had done a one-on-five tournament. It, it, it boggled my mind. So I was like, yo, I'm going to do a full, full court 21 tournament. I did it in 2013. I started it. By 2015, I was doing it around the world. I did it in Cuba with full court peace. I did it, I did it in 15 cities in Japan. I did it in five cities in Canada. And all the winners will be invited to the GOAT 
to do the uh the all world final and um i stopped it in 2019 because of the pandemic well i'm sorry in 2020 but it's still going on in hong kong tokyo they're still doing it um uh, we're going to do it in canada this summer but i'm not doing it in new york until the pandemic is over because the pandemic is too is too ill yo it's really put a a, a black eye on the gang in terms of my programming you know and i'm still encouraging people to play uh, and the way and the way they doing and the way they doing New York basketball, is something sick. Cause New York City, I mean New York State is the only state that doesn't have a high school championship because of the pandemic. Hold on, Shane the Dribbler Machine said uh, it was a tournament of called Tournament of Champions in the BX on 161st oh, wow. Street back in the day okay. as well. And he said he said uh, another thing he said he said I was in Puerto Rico in Bob hometown. And bumped it no to him years ago. No it was dope. Yeah, you know, Shane, 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 Shane. And he may not remember that, but me and him used to play against each other at Roberto Clemente State Park. They used to have an open run there. That, um, who used to run that? I think Coach Sid Jones had it there. And that's the first time I ever played against Shane. This is before he became, like, you know, fan. Yeah, I, but that's the first the time I played against Shane. But you know when the first time I met <laughs> Shane, he may not remember this either. The Source Magazine did a photo shoot and they brought down God Sham God, Malloy Nesmith, Future, um, Shane, and who and Pat. Pat uh what uh, what's Pat's last name? Pat Alphonse. Pat Alphonse. They had they did a photo shoot with the four yeah, of them yeah. um at uh on 77th Street and Columbus Avenue. It was like a uh uh that was, I used to play that three on three all the time. But they had me write the article. They had me come to the photo shoot and I wrote an article about about the uh about you know New York City playground basketball and everything, but that's the first time I met Shane, and then we played against each other at, at Roberto Clemente State Park, and then I played in the N one uh, mixtape tour in Puerto Rico, um, and that was in two thousand and six. Um, had a beautiful experience. I, I didn't play for N one; I played for Puerto Rico, and uh, it was AO had invited me to play. Nice. And I was like, "Yo, that's uh, that's beautiful." Be and I, I, of course, I wanted to play for N one, but I was like, "You know what? I, let me play with Puerto. Let me break my island." You know what I'm saying? Like. I didn't want to feel like a traitor, like playing, playing for, you know what I'm saying? So I played for PR. We got smacked. They smacked us by like 20, 30 points. Right, right. But, um, you know, I had a couple of highlights and, and a couple of, you know, it was a beautiful experience, man, being a part of that, you know. So shout out to Shane. Much love. Much love to Shane. He said, with the Clyde Dressler it? shoes, facts, stole all the gear. What did he say? <laughs> Yo, Shane, crazy. He said, uh, yes, with the Clyde uh, Drexler shoes, he said, they stole all the gear. <laughs> Yo, yo, let me, let's, Bob, let, you know, another touching uh, part of okay. the film I want to talk about, right? And, and I just want to uh, just go back a little bit. Um, what was your time at Wesleyan? Um, and, and when I first met you and you told me where you played at, uh, at, at Wesleyan, um, was, was definitely familiar with it uh, even back then. But just, it just seems those times at Wesleyan kind of built uh, a certain fabric in you and, and a stronger love for the ball. Again, when most guys would have quit, when most guys would have gave up on the game and themselves, it just, I think it made you stronger. What was it about those experiences that kept yeah, you digging so let me tell to you, be a Glenn, better player? Um, I didn't get recruited by any colleges except for FIT. And uh, there was a coach named, uh, what was it, Bear, Coach Bear, I think his name was. He was he didn't look like a coach, you know what I'm saying? He used to come to the GOAT, and he used to see us play, you know, pick up and stuff. Because, I mean, the GOAT was 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 a happening court, I told you, in the 80s, right? So he invited me and Alex Ashiel, who yep. played at LaSalle, down to FIT. And that's the only school that was, like, remotely interested in me in playing college ball. And I remember, you know, he was the assistant coach. The head coach was like, yo, like, there's 75% women here. You know what I'm saying? Like, you have a fantastic time. I was like, I didn't really want to go to two-year school. Uh, I didn't want to get, you know, study uh, fashion. I want to be in a, heavily involved in, in apparel and footwear, but, you know, um, and I want to be in a guest speaker at FIT, you know, more recently based on, on my sneaker book. Um, anyway, so I passed on FIT, and I, I decided to go to Wesleyan. Wasn't offered a, a, you know, scholarship there. They didn't have scholarships. It was Division three. you know. I tried out for the squad my, my right. freshman year, got cut. Tried out for the squad my sophomore year, got cut, played JV. Um, tried out for the squad my junior year, got cut. Now, meanwhile, in between 
every single uh, you know year, I'm coming back to New York and I'm playing in in a high bridge three on three against John Morton, you know, and I'm playing at the Goat against uh, you know Mo. What was Mo Mo's last name? You know Mo Blind, and I mean I'm playing against such incredible players on a regular basis. Doji, you know what I'm saying? Like Doji's one of the best players I ever played with or against. We they used to have an open run at uh, Central uh, Baptist in the basement. And Dooge would be in there. His real name is Joe Thomas. Um, he had a trial with the Knicks. The, the Knicks invited him to free agent camp when he was like 27, just based off of his playground dominance. You know what I'm saying? Like a lot of people don't know that. Like Dooge was, wow. I mean, Dooge is, <laughs> I mean, dancing Dooge, they called him dancing Dooge because he would, he would dance, you know what I'm saying? Like he'd be, you know, uh. so I would, you know, be playing against these dudes and I would come up back up to this D3 school and get cut. And I'm like, yo, like dancing Doogee picks me up on his squad and passes me the ball. Like, I know I could play D3, you know, in this, in this school. So, um, you know, but it never, I never let a coach, Glenn, and I'll say this to any young people or any, anybody at any age, I've never, never let a coach determine my love for the game. I never let a coach gauge my love for the game. Right. right. So every year I got cut at Wesleyan, I was just like, yo, that's all good. I'm going to keep on playing. I played intramurals my, my junior year. I averaged like 25 points. Let my... Y'all ready? Y'all ready? Y'all ready?